All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for what we hope you'll find is a informative and useful webinar on how to protect your home from fire using firewise landscaping practices uh, while still keeping in mind water use efficiency. Before we get started, I do want to touch on a couple matters of housekeeping. So first of all, this meeting is being recorded. Um, it'll be available after the meeting has ended on our website, alevenheim.com slash events. We'll also send out an email to the people that, who are registered for this, whose emails we had on file, send out a link to that as well. So you can go back if there's something that you want to view again, or if you joined um, late, people can view. Secondly, everybody's been muted upon entry. Um, you know, any background noise can make a big difference in interfering here. So we wanna make sure that you please keep yourself on mute until the end of the meeting. And then we will have a question and answer session. And lastly, if you have any questions during the presentations, feel free to use the chat box. The slide has um, the button highlighted there that you can press on and type in your question. Some of the questions we might be able to get to um, just via chat and responding back to real time. Other ones we might end up um, saving to the end for our question and answer session. So, oh, got a couple more people to let in. <laughs> All right, so on that note, I think we're ready to get started. Um, we are packing a lot into the agenda today. So first we have a brief presentation on the relationship between your water district and fire protection. Next, the City of Encinitas Fire Department will be sharing an introduction to firewise landscaping. And last, we have Greg Rubin from California's own native landscape design for a more in-depth look at firewise landscaping, along with reviewing some case studies of homes that have been through wildfires after implementing uh, firewise landscaping best practices. And then finally, of course, we'll have about 10 minutes at the end where people can ask their questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I, again, I am Jessica Cleaver with the Liebenheim Municipal Water District. I'm an administrative analyst here. And uh, throughout, the, throughout my portion of the webinar, I will just be referring to Liebenheim as OMWD because um, it's a lot faster and that's what I'm used to saying. <laughs> So OMWD was established in 1959 to provide safe and reliable water, wastewater, recycled water, recreation, and hydroelectric services in its service area, which spans 49 square miles and includes portions of Carlsbad, San Marcos, Escondido, Rancho Santa Fe, Del Mar, Solana Beach, and of course, Encinitas. Typically in the fall, we would hold a workshop at our Elfin Forest Recreational Reserve Interpreter Center honoring Susan J. Vardy. However, this year we have opted to go virtual um, to follow current health guidelines. So thank you for joining us for our first virtual uh, webinar. Unfortunately, another year of destructive wildfires in California. Um, we've seen another destructive year and it's just as important as ever that we learn what we can do to protect our homes. Um, thankfully, there are steps that we can do to improve the chances of your home withstanding a wildfire, which is exactly what we'll be covering today. Um, first, let me touch on what OMWD is doing to keep residents in its service area safe. Not only do we provide water service for the common uses that everybody thinks of, like drinking, hygiene, and irrigation, we also have a lot of infrastructure in place to provide fire protection. Um, so throughout the district, we have infrastructure like fire hydrants, um, fire, special fire pump stations, and also backup generators, which are becoming increasingly important um, given the public safety power shutoffs that have been occurring more frequently over the last couple of years. And also we work with our local fire departments to provide training opportunities. So this includes practicing uh, water drops from the Levenheim Reservoir, as can be seen on the picture on the left, as well as um, rescue trainings at our Elfin Forest Recreational Reserve. We also work with the um, neighboring fire districts. A lot of them are the first on the scene when there's accidents like hit hydrants and water line breaks. So um, being able to work with them to reduce water loss and property damage during those events is key. 
Now that I've scratched the surface on the relationship between fire and water districts, I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Fire Marshal Jordan Villagomez from the Encinitas Fire Department for his presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share so that you can share your presentation. Give me one sec here. Sure. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Um, like she said, uh, my name is Jordan Villa Gomez. Uh, I work for the NC's Fire Department. I'm a Deputy Fire Marshal, and uh, we're going to go through some things. Um, this is going to be the virtual defensible space workshop. We usually do these workshops um, once a year, but uh, since COVID and everything going on, uh, um, we had the opportunity to do it virtually with uh, Jessica's help from OMWD. So. Uh, so we can still uh, get the information out there about uh, what needs to be done and what can be done. Um, so, um, Encinitas has a uh, 20.16 square miles, has six stations, and um, we're going to learn some different items today that can. Here we go. So we're going to learn uh, fire threat and fire behavior, as well as the importance of the zero to five foot. Um, zone. We're going to talk about the different zones and uh, uh, the properties of each one and, and their importance. Next one's going to be the three R's, uh, uh, and we'll go into detail about that later, and then also maintaining your property. Defensible space, what is it? Natural landscaped area around a structure maintained and designed to reduce fire danger. Defensible working area. An area surrounding structures that allows firefighters and equipment the space to defend against approaching wildfire. This is a big one. It's not just uh, because of the defensible space you're providing to protect your home, but also it allows us the room to work and do the things we need to do in case of emergency situations and, and fires. Um, the goals of our presentation is going to be uh, to reduce, or I mean, of uh, defensible space is going to be to reduce flame lengths, um, keep flames from touching the structures. Also, reduce radiant heat from getting close to structures, um, giving firefighters the room to advance hose lines, as well as uh, providing a safe area for firefighters to help defend your homes and your neighbor's homes. Here's a good example of defensible space and, uh, and defensible working area. As you can see, these two firefighters right here are doing their best to protect this home. Um, you can see the space between the home and the actual heavy brush and vegetation and, and the flame lengths that that's uh, getting to. Providing that basic area between the, the home and that uh, vegetation allows us to advance our hose lines and work in that area to, 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 try, to, uh, to try to put the fire down or change the directions. Um, wildfire threats to structures, embers, radiant heat, and flame impingement. Flame impingement is direct flame contact to the structure or combustibles. Radiant heat is the heat produced from the fire from it getting close and, and how much vegetation is burning. And then uh, the, the third one is the embers, which is a product of the fire and uh, gets lofted into the air and then can travel um, a pretty good distance and start uh, farther ahead spot fires. They can also go into your eaves, which we will uh, talk about in a couple of slides. Fire behavior and spread. Um, the behavior and the spread uh, has a couple factors. Types of fuels and the amount. Depending on the vegetation in the area, um, a lot of California has coastal sagebrush. So that's the kind of fuels we're gonna be dealing with. Um, moisture content of the fuels, that can depend on uh, humidity or um, how much water those plants are getting. Topography and slope. If, the, uh, if your house is located on a canyon or uh, or a steep hill or a cliff or something like that, um, fire's gonna travel up. So that's gonna be a factor. Current weather, when it comes to weather, um, you know, it's California, uh, depending on the rainy season, how much uh, rain, annual rainfall we get that year, um, that could be a factor as well as uh, low humidity and Santa Ana winds. Um, 
the other one would be fire history and that is depending on the area when the, is the last time it burned um, and uh, how much fuel is there basically. So we're gonna get into the defensible space zones, three zones, the intermediate, immediate zone, zero to five feet around the home or the structure. The second is intermediate and that's five to 30 feet. And then the third is extended, which is 30 to hundred feet. Defensible space zero five is, uh, this is just gonna be the structure itself. The structure itself uh, in the high, if it's in the high fire hazard area, um, this stuff is required by code, uh, chapter 7A of the building code. Um, it is also good things if you're not in the high fire hazard area to think about with your structure. Non-combustible siding or uh, material, stucco brick, things like that, um, attic vents, ember resistant vents. The ones that your home was built with, if it's an older home, probably have a quarter inch um, gap in all the eaves. Um, with the recent fires in the last 30, 40 years, um, the embers can get in there into the vents. So the new, the new sizing they recommend is one eighth inch. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, large surface areas, roofs, decks, um, they have to be, roofs have to be uh, class A rated in Encinitas, which is non-combustible with the underlayment. Rain gutters and roof valleys, uh, you need to clear them out from pine needles, leaves, um, all that stuff from gathering so the embers can't go and fall there. Here's a picture of the eaves. Um, there's different kinds. There's a gable one up top. Um, one of the things they need to be, if you're going to be in high fires, they need to be a state fire marshal approved ember resistant. Um, there's a bunch of companies that do a lot of good stuff uh, that make retrofits. Uh, I think Vulcan, O'Hagan, and Brangard, they all uh, make retrofits that are cheap and affordable that you can uh, bolt to the back of your existing eaves or ones that you can replace. Um, very effective way of uh, keeping the embers out of the attic space. Um, so zero to five feet again, this is uh, removing flammable items away from the structure. Want to remove, uh, you don't want to put any wood mulch or, or ground cover next to the structure. Um, combustible patio furniture, you want to move that away. Um, stacks of firewood, don't be putting that next to the home. And then um, don't be storing stuff under your deck if it's combustible. Here's a good picture of the poinsettia and cocos fire in Carlsbad shows the uh, all this burnt area you can see on the left side is the wood mulch and it transitioned into rock and this is a good picture we went out and took um, after those fires happened to kind of show um, what's going on with the with the wood mulch thumbs down uh, so going back to the roofs and valleys and uh, rain gutters we want to make sure we clear them out um, and keep trees um, a little bit away from the structure it says uh, for chimneys, 10 feet away from chimneys. And then uh, we don't want branches to overhang onto the structure that will have accumulation of leaves and needles that embers can fly into and start a fire, catch your house on fire. Thumbs down. Uh, defensible space, five to 30 feet. This is an intermediate zone. This area is not as strict. Um, it goes, it's supposed to be irrigated. It has to be, um, you wanna keep 10 feet away from the chimney, same thing, you wanna prune your trees. Uh, six feet from the ground, talk about ladder fields in a little bit. Um, also, you, know, you want to keep things cut away from solar panels, propane tanks, uh, that sort of thing. Third and final zone, 30 to 100 feet, up to 100 feet. If you don't have 100 feet, then it's to your property line. Uh, we get a lot of calls because um, insurance companies don't want to cover people because they don't have 500 feet of brush clearance to their structure. That is the insurance company's policy. Um, but the state is 100 feet maximum. So good thing to know um, about that. You don't have to be clearing that far out and it's not clearing. It's different zones like we've been talking about. The first one's uh, most important. Got to clear all the dead or dying away from the second one. Um, you need to thin stuff out, not so much. And then third one, same thing. Um, so defensible space, we're talking about the three R's, remove, reduce, and replace. You want to remove any uh, non-fire resistant plants all dead and dying vegetation, um, and then reduce. You want to thin out pruning trees, uh, reduce the amount of group trees together, and then uh, uh, the other thing we talked about earlier, uh, we'll go into more depth, is the ladder effect. Um, replace. You want to replace it with drop taller landscape. Greg's going to go into detail about that later on more specific plant types uh, on what you can replace with that'll uh, be helpful, not use as much water, and, uh, and be fire safe. 
And then the fourth and final is maintain. You want to maintain um, once you get your stuff into a good working order that's a good decibel space. Here's some examples of uh, removing all dead and dying vegetation. Once you cut it, don't just pile up. You got to remove it. Ladder fuels. This is the process from when a uh, uh, fire is on the ground level, burning grasses, you want to reduce it from going up into the trees and canopy like a ladder. You don't want to climb the ladder and, and hit the canopy trees and, and keep moving. Um, this diagram on the bottom shows spacing of trees. Um, as you get further away from the house, they don't have to be as spaced far apart. Here's another example of ladder fuels. Left so you can see it's pretty uh, heavy. All that, all that middle area there uh, got removed so it doesn't allow it to travel on the ground up into the canopies and then start um, more trees on fire. Reduce flame length impingement. This is a great picture. Same thing, Cocos and Poinsettia fire uh, in Carlsbad. You can tell where that nice buffer zone is. A couple spots burned, but everything on the bottom side of that picture is uh, was burned. There was a bunch of homes lost there. Um, but you can tell by those, those houses on the top, they had a, a good buffer zone, um, low ground level, um, like ice plant kind of stuff. And uh, the flames kind of, you know, dried out some of their trees, but all those homes are still standing. Uh, same thing, replace. These are some good examples of replacing uh, your, your plants with some better plants that Greg will get into later. Uh, maintain your, your defensible space. Like we said, it's the fourth and uh, most important once you get there. You want to prioritize what you're going to do. Don't just, it's going to be a lot of work sometimes if you got to do your whole yard. Start with that closest zone, the zero to five, and then work your way out. Um, also, you want to be able to budget for it in these kind of times. We know it's it's hard. Uh, you know, not everyone's working right now, but but you know, try to try to make time and and uh, you know, save some money. Try, think about what's going to happen in the future. And then on that too is uh, work with your neighbors. Talk to your neighbors. Um, you know, you could go in uh, together on a contractor. Maybe they have a service call that's like a hundred bucks just to come out there um, to do stuff, and then they'll add stuff on top of it if uh, you work together or if just, you know, if they have a tree that that uh, is hanging over your yard or uh, you don't think is very safe, talk to them about it. Maybe they'll remove it. You don't even have to uh, worry about um, paying for it. Uh, other important things to remember, um, going back to what Jessica said in the hydrants, um, we want to make sure that we can get to the hydrants. You can see that picture in the top left that bush is overgrown. That didn't just happen uh, overnight. It takes some time. That bottom picture is nice and clear. We want three feet workable space around the hydrant so we can hook up the hose and, and uh, open the valve. Address numbers is another big one. We're not always, uh, it's not always just us here. In the bigger fire events, there are gonna be fire departments from um, up north and they might not know the area as well as we do. So those address numbers are gonna be important to them. Um, when they're when they're setting up and, and heading different directions to to fight the fire, that left one one seven four one nine maybe an eight maybe a zero I don't know that one on the right uh, four nine four eight the colors are contrasting and you can see them from the street. Fire access ways this is a big one too. Um, you want to move the trees and stuff away from the fire access. The height needs to be minimum thirteen six foot and that's just to get our apparatus underneath but we also want to cut them back from the road so that if, uh, if a fire is coming this direction, I don't know if I'm going to want to go down that road or not. And here's a good example of, of what a good one looks like. Nice and clear on both sides, 10 feet, easy. Wouldn't have a problem uh, getting apparatus or, or, uh, or truck down there. And then uh, as we're wrapping up, um, we're just talking about defensible space. We want to make sure you uh, have the right tools and uh, information to help you defend your own. Um, emergency plan, have a kit, have a bag ready to go that you can just grab on your way out. Know your routes in your area, um, depending on the direction of the fire, if it's coming from the south or the north, or uh, if Santa Ana winds are coming, blowing uh, east to west, you want to know multiple uh, directions out. Maybe you won't be able to use the same road that you, uh, you use every day when you come home from work. Also, uh, practice your emergency plan uh, and then customize it. Everyone's going to be different. Some people, maybe grandma and grandpa is living at home. Maybe there's an old lady down the road that doesn't move around so good. Um, you know, check on these people. Make sure you have a plan because uh, once stuff starts happening, you got to make quick decisions. Um, 
maybe young, maybe you have a bunch of young children, maybe you run a daycare, um, you need to have plans for all this stuff so that when stuff happens, you're going to know what you're going to do. Um, same thing, uh, large animals, if you have a horse, um, take early action, make sure you have a place to take it, make sure you're going to load up because it's going to take some time. Um, and then, uh, and then lastly is evacuate, um, staying calm, listen to orders from emergency personnel. The news is really good about getting information out about, um, the zones that are mandatory, uh, evacuation and ones that are optional. If it's still optional, you don't, you don't have to go, but we highly recommend it. The earlier you get out, the better it's going to be helpful for us. It's going to be easier for you. Um, so yeah, don't wait. Um, one of the last thing I want to touch on, Living Hain Fire Safe Council is a newly organized group. Uh, if you are living in a Living Hain, uh, you can reach out to them and here's their information. Um, and then like Jessica said, this, this uh, recorded presentation will be available um, if you haven't had time to write that down. And then lastly, here are some resources. Firewise.org and then also Ready San Diego. Um, if you haven't registered your mobile device, uh, Alert San Diego through Ready San Diego. You can register your mobile device and uh, emergencies in your area, you will be notified. The old way was the landline. That was uh, reverse 911, but everyone has cell phones now. Landlines are going away. Um, the uh, You register your device and you get updated on uh, evacuations and other things that uh, in your area, flash floods, um, all that stuff. Um, so with that, that is my presentation. Uh, thank you for your time and I will turn it back over to Jessica. Great, thank you so much for that. That was really informative. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and stop the screen share. And Greg, if you're ready, you're up next. But you are muted. You're still muted. <laughs> We can't hear you, Greg, you're still muted. There we there go. You know, can you hear me now? Perfect. Sorry about that, I was having some mouse issues. It's quite all right. All right, let's go ahead and share the screen on this. Look good. You see all right? Okay. All right. So my name is Greg Rubin. Thank you very much, Jessica. And I'm excited to be here. And that was an excellent presentation by Jordan there. Um, really captured a lot of the current thinking too, especially that zero to five foot space, which you don't hear much about. And they're right on the leading edge of things. So I was very impressed. So I'm gonna come at it from a little different angle. I'm gonna come at it from fire, from an ecological standpoint, and then also from a native horticultural standpoint and how we can actually use native, land, native plants to create a fire resistant landscape. No, it's not an oxymoron. You can actually achieve both goals and we have because we've had close to three dozen of our homes, our landscapes go through major fire events. So we actually have uh, some real case histories which we'll share with you at the end. Um, but that's what we were trying to avoid was that house burned down in script, even though it was completely surrounded by lawn. Uh, here's a little background on me. I was an aerospace engineer turned contractor and uh, we've done over 750 native landscapes, including uh, we did the infill the Del Mar Thoroughbred Racetrack, the Lux Art Institute in Encinitas, and then uh, Sanderling, which is a large uh, complex in uh, Aviera with a lot of green space. And proud to say that we, 2013, we came out with this book, California Native Landscapes. Um, and it has a whole chapter just on natives and fire and what we learned in the uh, Cedar Fire and the Witch Creek Fire. 
And then just more recently, we came out with the Drop Defying California Garden, which is a plant selector and 230 of uh, some of the best native plants to use in your garden. So a little background. Um, I'm gonna start with the ecology. I'm, gonna, I'm going to emphasize chaparral because a lot of the plants that we use come from chaparral, the coastal sage scrub, and the oak woodland plant communities. So when we talk about using certain species in native landscapes, we're generally talking about the ecology and the fire ecology that follows these. And unfortunately, there's a lot of threats to our native plant communities. Uh, one of them is land abuse. You can look at that photo and think that you're looking at oak savanna, but no, actually, you're looking at cow pasture with some oak trees in it. That was once all chaparral, coastal sage scrub, and oak woodland, and they came in and they used fire, or they used chains and ripped all the vegetation out so that they could graze cattle on it. You'll sometimes see, especially with all this uh, carbon credit money floating around, they'll go out and they'll just clear in the middle of nowhere uh, and just unfortunately create some real ecological damage because something that might start out as a fuel reduction very quickly turns into non-native grassland. And this is a terrible situation to be in because these dead dry grasses are non-native. Uh, they don't have any erosion control and we're still their flashy fuels and fires uh, light this stuff up instantaneously. So we're really trying to avoid that kind of a situation. And here, I mean, it's kind of ironic, they call it the Coles Levy Ecosystem Reserve because there really isn't any ecosystem left here, so to speak. You can even see up in the upper left corner here, all these erosion rills and that. And this is just what happens with way too frequent fires. And you're left with just a weedy, dead, eroding mess. So that's true, chaparral can actually be eliminated by the wrong kind of fire. It's not really made to burn. Chaparral is made to burn like your house is made to burn because you have fire insurance, okay? It is, here's an example. I love this picture because it shows you whatever increasing fire frequency does to the landscape. Uh, in the upper left, this all burned in 1970 and it's re recovered rather nicely. In the middle section here, there was yet another fire in 2001 and it is having trouble and has a lot of weeds in it and is very degraded and then burned again in the Cedar Fire or the Harris Fire in 2003 and all it is is a weed patch. And these things are ready to burn every August when those weeds die and they're eroding and it's a mess. So chaparral does not need fire to exist, it has fire insurance. And if you burn it too many times, you lose the ecosystem. And you end up with something that started out green and burdened and lovely like this, and turn it into something like this from way too many fires. So this, this is not a natural native landscape. This is, this is Armageddon. This is, this is a burned out hulk of its former self. So being dense and impenetrable and prone to huge intense fires is the natural condition of chaparral. And I can't emphasize this enough, especially with some of the politics that's in play these days. It is not the fault of conservationists nor past fire service suppression policy, okay? I would maintain that fire suppression, especially in chaparral, Maybe a little different story in forest, but certainly in Chaparral, <laughs> the huge fires we've had do not have anything to do with either conservation or with a past policy of suppression. Just ask them how well their suppression is working these days. You can go to Northern California and ask them all about fire suppression, okay? It's a myth. Most experts agree on a natural fire frequency of every 30 to 130 years, okay? If you burn chaparral any more frequent than that, you lose the ecosystem. 
as I've shown in those previous photos, okay? So just the fact that it exists in some areas means that you've got a fire cycle that is at least less than once every 30 years, probably more like every 50 to 200 years. Okay, so why, why is this, all right? Ignition sources, what? So prior to human habitation, what were your ignition sources? Well, lightning. How about lightning? Did anybody mention lightning? Okay. Oh, wait, there's another one. Volcanoes. All right. And how often do you have lightning storms during Santa Ana wind events like we have today? Do you see any thunderclouds out there? Are we going to get any rain? Is there any lightning? No. So it was a pretty rare confluence of events before humans showed up that would cause one of these catastrophic fires. And that's why they think, and they've done carbon core studies where they poured into the soil and looked at carbon layers to see what the frequency of actual fire was. And that's how they established a rough frequency of every 30 to 130 years. And that's probably conservative. And people say, well, what about the indigenous burning? Yes, they did burn. Uh, but on an evolutionary time scale, human presence is a blip. They've only been around for maybe 15,000 years versus maybe 10 million years of evolutionary development that got us here. So most of that development, most of that evolving was going on prior to human habitation, okay? And certainly when indigenous people would burn, they weren't out to burn down their village or their neighbors or their food sources. These were very localized fires that were done for agricultural reasons, all right? These weren't huge, enormous fires. That doesn't mean that they didn't get away from them and have catastrophic fires. But in general, they took measures to contain the fire and make sure it wouldn't spread. And the area that burned, it burned the shrubbery off and up would come the bulbs and the perennials, the forbs, and that's what they would harvest as their agriculture. So the vast, vast majority of fires nowadays are human caused. This is a really interesting statistic right here. Between 1919 and 2016, and you could extrapolate to 2020, 97 to 100 percent of all Southern California fires were human caused. 97 to 100 percent for all counties. That's a staggering number. So what are our human ignition sources? Well, arson, you've got some wackos running around that are lighting fires, unfortunately, and I'm always nervous on days like this when we have Santa Ana conditions with hot, dry, zero humidity, 100 degree temperatures, and we're having them more and more frequently. Uh, electrical fires, power lines, transformers, uh, 2007 fires, a lot of those unfortunately were caused by uh, fire, uh, by arcing and power lines. Um, smoking, hopefully this is becoming less of a risk now, but it's still out there. There's still fires started by people throwing cigarettes or other things out. This is a big one that people don't think about. Sparking due to landscape equipment. Lawnmowers, edgers, machetes, all hitting rocks or metal. This is huge, guys. If you're gonna go weed whacking in a dry field, Please, please, please either have, you know, 10 gallon uh, water containers out there that you can douse out a fire from a spark or better yet a hose. Don't go out there and start working in these areas if you're up against the wildlands without some way to douse the fire because it happens all the time. This is actually a very common cause. People burning trash, that's what started the uh, big fire in Mount Palomar about 1998, I think. Uh, somebody decided to burn the trash in the middle of the Santa Ana and goodbye Palomar Mountain. And cars, you see this a lot. When catalytic converters go bad, they start spewing out their guts and 
uh, sparks and you'll see these little fires starting right along the roadway as they're driving along. They're not even aware half the time they're lighting all these fires. So, and then of course you still have children playing with fire. Okay, and unfortunately those 2014 uh, fires, part of that was caused by, I think a 13 or 14 year old kid running around lighting fires. I mean, it's unfortunate, but that's what caused it. So he talked about fire zones. I'm so glad that he talked about that zero to five foot zone because we're gonna talk about the effectiveness of having no vegetation and having aprons there it can be huge. Um, usually the zonal approaches are within a hundred feet. Zone one or A is usually the first 30 to 50 feet and zone two or B is usually 50 to 70 feet out from there or more because this first zone is critical to defensible space. Usually what's causing fires are embers flying ahead of the flame front or unfortunately burning animals, which is horrible to contemplate, but it happens. And boy, do fences like to burn. Fences can be a wooden wick that goes right up to your garage and allows that fire to get up under the eaves and start in your garage and you're off to the races. So also piles of wood and debris. I'm gonna show you an example of a house that was saved because they removed the wood and debris from around the house. And stucco walls are much better for contact in the house. So even if you have a wooden fence where it makes the turn in towards your garage there, build that out of non-flammable materials. The gate and the little wall there can be stucco or other materials so that you don't wick it right into the house. Also, lots of hardscape around the house. In this case, we have a very open southwestern landscape with lots of gravel, okay? So this makes for a much more defensible condition than if you have vegetation and tons of mulch and it's encroaching right on the house. Don't plant under the eaves. Jordan emphasized this. This house here, so this is one of the first fire clients I had, or to show. And this was in the Witch Creek fire up in Ramona. This fire was so hot that the lawn even burned. This streak up here was a water tank. That silver streak up there are the, is the remains of an aluminum water tank. That's how hot this fire is. And yet they didn't lose the house. They have, we had a concrete apron going all the way around the house and the patio overhead was a metal structure rather than wood. This went through the Cedar Fire in 2003. This was one of the first truly fire resistant landscapes we ever built and it later became part of our study for the United States Navy that we're going to talk about in a minute. So these pictures were actually taken fairly recently but the landscape went in about 2002, just before the Cedar Fire. And one of the things we did was we built a gravel apron all the way around the house. Nowadays, I wouldn't even build an apron. I would just run that gravel right on out to the pathway here with the decomposed granite. But we really didn't have any experience. We were at that time, there wasn't a lot about it and we were just kind of going from common sense. But it really did help save this home and create. Plus the vegetation is fairly low around the house so that we didn't get the flame length up into the uh, eaves and the eaves were boxed in and it was a very fire safe condition and that is why it was able to survive this conflagration. Also in that first zone is where we use the watered plantings. This actually is not a lawn, this is actually a native sedge that is used like a lawn. This is in La Jolla and uh, being in La Jolla, I thought they were going to mow this thing, but they liked the look of the sedge so much they just left it like that. So there's a low maintenance lawn for you that you can step on in that. Uh, but if you choose, you can also mow it too. And it looks just like and functions just like grass, but uses half the water. So this is a great place to use these is right around the house in that first 30 to 50 feet. In zone two, which is that 30 to 50 out to 100 feet or more, um, Site hygiene is everything, managing existing native vegetation. 
we took all the weeds out here. We really cleaned it to bare ground. And actually this oak tree is a rare and endangered Engelman oak and it's bright yellow because it's covered in bright yellow flowers. That was how it thanked us for actually removing all those nasty non-native weeds by going into bright bloom, which is one of the reasons they're so rare because they don't flower anymore. So double benefit here. Site hygiene is critical. You don't want a situation like this where the only native thing in this picture is this one oak tree right here. All this dead, dry stuff are non-native mustard and fillery and oat grass. Unfortunately, though, people see this and they assume this is native and that's what their native landscape is going to look like. No, actually, this is a dirty, nasty cow pasture that's ready to burn every summer. This is, needs to be cleaned up. This is an important part of site hygiene. It also helps the the health of the native plants that you do have and helps them remain hydrated. Here's another example where this mission manzanita was right in the middle of the cedar fire. Well, fortunately my client practiced good site hygiene and got rid of all the non-native weeds from around it. Well, you wouldn't even know a fire came through here because it was healthy and happy. The leaves weren't even singed. It was just bright and uh, no, no singeing, nothing, except you can tell a fire came through from the obvious discoloration. Also, this dead wood knot burned out in the middle here. But the fact that it was good hygiene and light hydration, the, the plant absolutely did not burn. And this is so fundamental to what we do here. The only thing that burned was a little bit of the natural duff layer, and that flame height was probably two inches. This is something I also want to uh, emphasize that Jordan touched on because you want to remove ladder fields. So for us, the rule of thumb is to prune up shrubs three times the height of whatever is growing around it, the understory, okay? You want to maintain that separation. So if you've got Two feet of understory, you want at least six feet of clearance between the top of that understory and the bottom branches of the, of the tall tree, trees or shrubs. That helps prevent laddering from the bottom to the top and starting into a crown fire situation, which is a disaster. Thinning, so we do not like the term clearing. Clearing practically, uh, implies that you're running a bobcat through it and just clearing it to bare ground. Well, it turns out that may be one of the worst things you can do. It's actually better to go in and thin it out like this, because by thinning by 50%, you actually remove about 70% of the fuel volume and you open up little fire breaks within the vegetation here and you haven't destroyed the ecology and created a lot of erosion, destroyed habitat. And we take the chips, we actually chip up the vegetation we remove and put it right back down again uh, as a low mulch that also helps keep the weeds and flashy fuel from developing, which move the fire along instantaneously and also affect the health and hydration of the native plants that remain. So. This has been a really good policy. I've got other pictures of this that you can see how nice it looks when it's done correctly. It's really, you, you carve out your own native landscape or park. In fact, there you go. We put paths in it, we can put benches in it, bird baths, but it's opened up to about 40 to 50% canopy coverage and the mulch, we do put it down, but it's low enough that it's not really laddering up into the uh, vegetation and it's keeping the erosion down, it's keeping the weeds, more importantly, from getting established, which compromise everything. It's those grasses and weeds, the non-native grass and non-native mustard and fillery, those actually go take it from being a contained situation to out of control, flashy fuel, you know, 100 acres goes up simultaneously type, type situation. And here's what a nicely thinned, Chaparral, uh, native chaparral, this is natural chaparral 
that has been nicely maintained and thinned out to about 50% canopy coverage. You can walk all through here. It's very comfortable. There's no weeds and it's like a park. It's very healthy. The, the, the plants themselves are very healthy. They're well hydrated because there's no weeds destroying the ecology and robbing the moisture. And you know what? It looks really nice. It looks like your own private preserve, your own private park. Now, one of the other things that we do, especially if we're, we're planting uh, in that zone two, is we do like to put light permanent irrigation. That is incredibly important. It spelled the difference between landscapes burning and landscapes not burning. Houses burning, apparently, and houses not burning. And one of our favorite ways to do it is with something called MP rotators made by Hunter right here in San Marcos, a local company. These things put down the equivalent of a light rainfall. It's the perfect way to water your native plants. We like much better than drip systems. It's a very natural way to apply water. It's incredibly water conserving and it's wonderful for hydrating the whole site and the plants and the foliage. We're even experimenting with taking natural coastal sage scrub right around structures and putting a little bit of light irrigation on there. And you can clearly see the difference here. In the foreground, we've got light, you know, it's, it's only like thunderstorm level irrigation two or three times a month. And then the unirrigated natural coastal sage scrub beyond it. Look at the difference there in the vegetation. Look how green and hydrated this vegetation is. And we find that that has consequences for, uh, flame length, flame intensity, and fire spread. So it's a real, real market contrast, but it's all the same natural vegetation. This was not planted. So also, when we landscape in that 100 foot zone, this is actually, I think, a pretty good illustration. So right around the house, first 30 feet, we've got well-watered, conventional, well-spaced vegetation. In this case, we surrounded it with a rock wall, okay? There's a couple of sycamores in there about 10 feet from the house, so they're not impinging on the house. Also, do notice that the roof on this home, it's a metal roof, and this is located out in Eastern Ramona. And the other thing is right at about 70 feet, 75 feet, we actually put in a, 14 foot wide road, okay? So within this perimeter, this is your, kind of your zone two in here. This is lightly watered native vegetation that we planted. Then we have this road that goes all the way around the house, comes back and around again. So this road acts as a fire brace break. It's a, it's a great defensible space that the crews can get in there and set up. They can light backfires on the outside perimeter here if they want. And at first the homeowner was horrified when I told them I was gonna put a road around their house, but they later grew to love their country lane. Here's the same house. One of the other things we did is we put an eight to 12 foot wide decomposed granite apron all the way around the house, okay? And then the vegetation, this is all lightly irrigated, low-growing native vegetation that's spaced out, okay? This home has now survived four fires. <laughs> it's been through four fire events, okay? And the home is doing beautifully. The landscape is still there. The oak trees are still there because they didn't burn down because we took all the weeds out from under them. They're actually quite fire resistant when you don't have a carpet of weeds under them that are weakening and dehydrating and killing them, okay? So this is a house that's been through four fires. One thing else I wanna note, yes, they have these eaves right here, but the metal roof really goes a long way. And if you want to plant something in this area here, wild grape is great, wild grape. And I'll show you some pictures later. It does really well in fires. It's a fantastically self-hydrated plant. So it makes a beautiful vine too. Yeah, three, now four. 
All right, guys, so this is what it's like. I'm sure Jordan can relate to this. You know, when you're in, a, when you're in the middle of a fire event in the Santa Ana, I mean, you're getting hit with embers, you know, as thick as the old fire falls of Yosemite going sideways. I think you're in less than 10% humidity. You've got this ember attack going on. That's what burns structures is not just typically a single ember, but ember attack and accumulation and getting into uh, vents and getting into cracks and just staying there and dwelling and building up and finally getting enough uh, heat energy to actually ignite the fire, okay? So um, the US Navy heard about our success in fire resistant native landscapes. And when somebody comes along and tells them that, well, you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. In other words, you can landscape around developments with fire resistant plants that are also native, that are also habitat, that are also low maintenance, that are also low water use, okay? And a wonderful erosion control that gets their that gets their attention because um, why the Navy people ask they're out in the middle of the ocean no actually they maintain tens of thousands of acres of naval housing on their bases that are right up against the wildlands so this is an excellent solution and they've heard of all of our anecdotal stories and our experiences they wanted to actually apply some science to it. So they sponsored this five-year study, which concluded last year. Uh, the problem is, and I don't include Encinitas. I was actually, I have to tell Jordan, that was a great presentation. That thing was really on the money and really represents the leading edge of the current thinking. And I'm incredibly impressed with Encinitas. Um, unfortunately, until now, most of the approaches have been kind of anecdotal, not really based on experimental design. And a lot of the approaches were highly destructive to the environment with kind of inconsistent outcomes. And so we got awarded this research grant and it was called the Ecologically Sustainable Fire Risk Reduction, the SFRR program. And I was the co-principal investigator with Dr. John Keeley, who is one of the foremost fire ecologists in the world and is based out of three rivers up in uh, up in Kings County, up in Northern California. So it was a scientific study and the following mutual goals, develop science-based fuel management strategies, do it in a way that was ecologically sustainable and support natural habitat, lower water and maintenance requirement, aesthetically pleasing. And then we would take the data that we collected and we plugged it into the fuel and fire tools modeling software. We use this highly advanced modeling software because people are a little loath to have you actually light fires on their property. So <laughs> this is what we use, but it's extremely accurate and it's, it's brand new. They've been putting a lot of years of research into developing this. So the experimental design. We needed homes that were located at the wildland urban interface. You'll hear that term a lot, wooey, and which had survived a major fire event. And they included a lightly irrigated native landscape, natural chaparral that had been thinned on that property, and then a control area of natural shrubland vegetation. So all of these homes met this criteria that we used for the study. And before I get into the results here, the way we took data is we actually built uh, in each of these areas, we put in moisture sensors and we put in little miniature weather stations. So we could measure the relative humidity, the wind speed, uh, the soil moisture, the air temperature, and all of these were plotted uh, into this uh, fire modeling software. And that's how we got the results. So here are some of the results. Uh, this is our graphs of the rate of fire spread, okay? And I will tell you that these results were independent of slope and wind speed. So what am I saying here? In each of these graphs, you've got a dotted line. That represents an irrigated native landscape. 
Okay, and then the dashed line is a thin, thin to approximately 50%. And then the solid line is the unirrigated, unthinned control. In every one of these cases, the irrigated landscape had the lowest rate of fire spread, followed by the thinned, followed by the non, um, what's the word I'm looking for? the unmodified fuel, okay? And here you can see as the slope percentage goes up, the rate of fire spread climbs lightly, but notice in all cases, the irrigated and thin are have a lower rate of fire spread by about 30, 40% than the unirrigated, unthin. Here again, these are, this was just isolating buckwheat. Now buckwheat is a plant that people tend to think of as a firebomb, but it's interesting that the firebombs often benefited the most from the little bit of irrigation that we give them. Here's general chaparral, okay? Again, the same thing, lowest rates of fire spread, irrigated followed by thin, followed by unmodified. Here is wind speed picks up from, in this case, zero to up all the way up to 32 kilometers an hour. In all cases, yes, the rate of fire spread does climb with wind speed, okay? However, in all cases, that relationship remains. The lightly irrigated, the 50% thin natural vegetation and the unmodified vegetation, same for chaparral site. Uh, Dr. John Keeley said these results went beyond his expectations. They actually were even more positive and consistent than he ever expected. And certainly if we think, we believe that this, uh, these factors contributed to all of our structures surviving intense fire events. So the study was published recently in May 20th in the Bulletin of the Southern California Academy of Science. Uh, it was called Protecting the Wildland Urban Interface in California, Green Belts versus Thinning for Wildlife, well, sorry, Wildfire Threats to Homes, okay? So that's where the study can be accessed. So rate of fire spread is lowest for lightly irrigated native plantings followed by thin natural vegetation compared to untreated controls. These benefits apparent regardless of slope angle or wind speed. Native plants maintain a much higher live fuel moisture content than traditional plants on less water. Let me say that again, native plants maintain a much higher relative live fuel moisture content than traditional plants given the same amount of water, okay? And of those, the evergreen native plants like Ceanothus, uh, wild lilacs like Manzanitas, actually exhibited the highest levels of live fuel moisture content. And then if you go one step further and use lower growing native plants, they have even better fire behavior. Okay, which you would think a lower profile means less fuel, less flame height. The bottom line in this is that it's not about plant list. It's really, really about hydration. And what this study shows is that it takes so much less water to hydrate a native plant. And when it's in a hydrated condition, the rate of fire spread is the lowest compared to thinning, compared to untreated vegetation, okay? This really flies in the face of a lot of conventional wisdom that if you plant the native plant around your house, it's going to spontaneously combust and burn down your house, okay? We actually have had all of our homes survive these huge fire events, knockwood, um, because there are other independent factors that could still burn a house down. And they're completely surrounded by native vegetation. In many cases, the neighbors on both sides unfortunately burn to the ground, okay? 
So let's talk about plant selection and different options. Okay, so hydration takes precedence over plant lists. Okay, here's a very unscientific study I did years ago. <laughs> we had gotten a quarter of inch of rainfall the previous week. Uh, the relative humidity was on the low side here. It wasn't a Santa Ana, but it was probably about 25 to 30%. And we just said, let's just go pick some vegetation around here and try to light on fire, right? And so what typically happened, in this case, Ceanothus and sugar bush, we couldn't get it to sustain a fire. We couldn't get it to sustain flames. Uh, even the sage that had been lightly hydrated wouldn't burn worth a darn. I even piled them all up and tried to light them up. We just couldn't get it to sustain any kind of, uh, any kind of flame. And that was because they were lightly hydrated and being native plants, they hung on to that hydration. However, same day, same location, same weather. Look what happens when you add dead, dry, non-native fuels to the mix. And those become your ladder fuel. They're not hydrated. They have much higher flame lengths and they allow for the dwell time to finally ignite, ignite surrounding vegetation. When they're lighting backfires in the back country, for instance, they're not trying to light chaparral. Chaparral is typically very difficult to light. They're actually lighting the grass and the weeds, okay? To start the backfire, to burn back against the fire front so it exhausts the fuel before the fire can come in. And the, and the bottom line is that native plants require much less water to achieve hydration than non-native plants. It's a pretty simple concept, but it really kind of still sort of is jarring because people kind of expect the opposite. So here are some basic types of plantings for fire resistant slopes, including nothing at all, which is typically a pretty bad option <laughs> for slopes around the house. You can plant ice plant, right? That's always been the go-to. A drought tolerant non-natives and succulents, and then natives. And all of these have their advantages and disadvantages. Okay, start with ice plant. What are the advantages of ice plant? Cheap and readily available. They produce quick fill. They're green. The disadvantages, they are moderate to downright poor erosion control. There's a lot of reasons for this I won't get into other than the fact they're not deeply rooted and they're very heavy. They need really lots of water to maintain a level of fire resistant hydration. If you look at some of those fire photos from 2014, you can see the red apple burning nicely on a lot of these slopes. Ice plant is invasive. It gets into natural areas and takes over. It can form a thatch that burns. That's a big deal. Under this ice plant, there can be a foot or more of dead thatch. And what happens is that catches on fire and then the green vegetation above it, it boils off all of its water and then what's left burns. And ice plant's boring to downright ugly, okay? So I'm not a big fan of ice plant on slopes. Now we could go to drought tolerant native, non-natives and succulents, Mediterranean plants, for instance. What are the advantages? They, they actually are often have better availability than many natives. It's ironic that something that's native to California could be considered a specialty plant, but that's kind of how it is until we get more of them out there. Uh, there are many beautiful non-native Mediterranean plants. They can be very colorful. Disadvantage is they do need about twice the water than comparable natives to achieve that level of fire resistant hydration. Okay, so they do need about two times the amount of water and that's empirical. It's based on, on, on uh, experience. Uh, they certainly are better slope stabilizers than ice plant, but they're not nearly as good as California natives at stabilizing slopes. They do require higher maintenance than natives typically because they usually require more deadheading. So all these beautiful plants, there is a bit of a price in that when they're done blooming, all these deadheads need to be pruned back in order for fire safety, 
and for appearance. Okay, so that does up the amount of uh, hand maintenance that needs to be done. And they don't have quite as much wildlife uh, value as native plants, which is what our wildlife evolved with, okay? So here we go, natives. And this is a uh, development called uh, Sanderling. It's in Carlsbad. When we got there, this place was covered in red apple and honeysuckle. These oak trees in the background were deeded on the property. They had to be saved. And when we got there, they were half dead. Bare branches, dying, probably only had a year or two left. So we took all that junk out of there and we replaced it with a beautiful open fire resistant native landscape. And people love their landscape there. We also planted wildflowers. And look at these oak trees. They came bursting back to life by removing the non-native antagonists and putting plants that were actually symbiotic with them. They're pushing out three feet of growth a year now. And because they're healthier and happier, they're better hydrated. Okay, that is a real significant factor that gets lost in all of this. These landscapes are lightly irrigated about once every 10 days with overhead rainfall type irrigation, but they require much less water. The, the stuff that was replaced was being watered three to seven days a week, including winter time. Ours are being watered once every 10 days in the summertime. And look at it, it's a beautiful landscape and it's open and very country-like. Uh, the soil biology is actually naturally soil stabilizing. That's what ice plant doesn't have. There's actually all kinds of microorganisms and fungi that attach to the root systems of native plants that actually hold the soil together and act like a sponge and give all kinds of benefits and store water. And that's missing with ice plant, all right? And it's actually that fungi in that that actually helps stabilize and glue the soil together. The evergreen natives are virtually no maintenance, okay? Like these wild lilacs in here. Uh, we never have to use any fertilizer or soil amendments. In fact, that's the worst thing you can do with a native landscape. They're great bird and butterfly habitat and they give us a sense of regional identity. This is what California used to look like, guys. Gee, it was ugly, huh? No, it was beautiful, all right? And, <sighs> Their Western bluebirds are a pretty rare bird now. They were much more common one time. Well, this is actually happens to be a power line easement that runs through here. I have literally seen a hundred Western bluebirds at one time on the power lines waiting to jump into this habitat and feast, and they're nesting in there too. Okay, so natives have so many positives. They're natural, once you get about 70% canopy coverage, they're actually naturally weed resistant. Okay, that is an important factor. And if you've been out and seen healthy chaparral, one thing you notice is it's clean as a whistle. The indigenous people talked about walking 200 miles barefoot through it. Well, you wouldn't go 200 feet barefoot through a typical field in your neighborhood, right? This is, this is kind of what we've done to our environment here, guys. We've really messed it up. Some of the disadvantages are there's not as many suppliers. That's starting to change though. You're starting to see them more and more in nurseries. They really don't like ornamental horticulture and they just really don't do that great on drip irrigation, which I know is a shock, but there's a lot of reasons for that. The bottom line is that you want to treat natives you want to give them their natural environment and the way they get watered is through rainfall. So we give them light overhead irrigation. It works great, okay? This is sort of a localized swamp irrigation and natives don't love it. Native swamp plants love it, okay? But there can be a lot of problems putting natives on drip irrigation. And they also don't like fertilizer or soil amendments, okay? And they don't like too frequent water. 
And well, actually, I forgot, we'll talk a little bit about this fungi in the soil, the mycorrhizae that actually stores water and nutrition and moves it around and ties all these plants together like they're working like one giant organism. All these plants in this picture are tied together by the soil fungi, myco meaning fungus, rhizae meaning roots. That's kind of what they look like. There's, you don't worry, you won't be tested on this. This is endomycorrhizae, which form inside the, the cells of the roots. They form these little arbuscules. Ar arbuscular mycorrhizae is another name. They actually penetrate into the root cells. And there's an exchange of mineral and water from the mycorrhizae and sugars from the plants that go to the fungus. And there's ectomycorrhizae. In this case, it doesn't penetrate. It actually forms a sheath around the root. And then it forms these nets around these cortical root cells. And there's an exchange of moisture and nutrition going across these cell membranes. And so people, this has almost been entirely ignored by horticulture until recently, but it's a real important part of success with natives. It's not that big a deal. You don't have to inoculate or get crazy. You just don't want to, you just want to, uh, supply conditions that are going to work in its favor and not work against it. So low disturbance, no soil amendments, no fertilizer, overhead rainfall, you know, and let nature do its thing. When you design a native landscape, 75% of the planting should be evergreen. So these are all manzanitas and wild lilacs and native island buckwheat that all have highly colorful contrasting foliage and look good like this all year long, okay? And then it's really one of the most important principles because this is what creates the backbone to the landscape for the whole year long. The problem is a lot of people go for all the color and put in all these flowering plants and sages and that and it looks like a riot of color in spring and looks like absolute tumbleweeds in fall, okay? This is what holds the landscape together and keeps it looking good throughout a year, the year and gives you a lot of color and texture and contrast as well, and gives you a lot of fire resistance. Our tests were showing that the evergreen plants are amongst the most fire resistant of the natives. Then the other 25%, those are the color spots, the perennials, and those go right along the edges where you can see that color right up front. And more important, you can get at it and deadhead these flowers when they're done blooming very easily right next to the pathway. And then we mix plants that bloom at different times of the year so that something is going into bloom all the time. So this is how you create a beautiful year round native landscape. This is actually Luxard Institute, which is in uh, Jordan's jurisdiction. And I had a lot of very positive interaction uh, with Encinitas Fire during the development of this project. It was great. So we don't like drip. This is how we like to actually water a native uh, landscape with overhead, low volume, MP rotator type sprinklers on 12 inch pop-ups. And then when we plant, you wanna space them out for final size, and we typically use one to five gallon plants, okay? And these things grow so fast that uh, uh, it's really not worth putting in larger plants. These things, some of these can grow a foot a month. Okay, so let's talk about mulch. So not all mulch is created equal. Okay, our favorite mulch is shredded redwood bark, but not all plant communities want bark mulch or organic mulch. Desert and coastal strand and grasslands actually want inorganic sand, rocks, and gravel, okay? This is sort of a chaparral landscape. Now, will this stuff burn? Yes, however, it ha if you consolidate it, it is so important. This is also an important aspect of overhead watering. It is critical to fire resistance to consolidate this stuff down. It goes from three to four inches down to about an inch. And when it's consolidated, it is less oxygenated. And I've actually got pictures of how it performed in fires. People ask, should I leave the oak litter in place? I say, yes, why? 
because if you remove the oak leaf litter, yes, it can burn, but if you remove the oak leaf litter, the weeds will come in, dehydrate the oak, the oak will be sick, the weeds will burn, and a less hydrated, unhealthy oak tree will also burn. So you're better off uh, having a nice oak leaf litter around it that's retaining moisture and keeping the weeds out on a hole then removing them and exposing it to weeds and dehydration and death. So this is how fast they grow from one gallon plants. This is that same planting at 14 months, all right? So here's what the shredded redwood bark did in an actual fire. Now, what is my mistake here, guys? I know you're thinking this, I know Jordan's thinking this. This is back in 2002 again, 2003. We hadn't quite learned our lessons yet, but we ran the mulch right up, <laughs> right up to the screed line, right? But this mistake actually does give us a window into fire behavior, because if you look, you can actually see the scorch marks on the wall. And because this was well consolidated, poorly oxygenated mulch, and this is in the middle of the cedar fire, guys, your flame height was only about two inches. In addition, areas did not burn. And I think the most telling are these plastic flags right here. These plastic flags were actually placed prior to the fire. They were here during the fire. And the mulch was smoldering underneath it and it didn't even melt the plastic flags except for this one, but it wasn't the mulch that melted it. It was the burning garden hose, okay? I would not do this again. I would not run the mulch up here, but my screw up actually did show you kind of how the scorch marks were and that flame height, okay? When we plant, we basically dig a hole and stick them in. We don't use amendments or fertilizer and maybe make it one half to one inch shallower than the root ball so that the plant sticks up a little bit. And that's for settling later on. And we make it about twice as wide so we have room to work in there. And we'll backfill the soil and do a little plant dance around them. And you can create a temporary basin if you want. If you have some six to 12 inch boulders over here on the right, great, put them right on the root ball. Just give it a little, room for the plant to grow in the middle, not a campfire ring, I mean, right on the roots. They love it, keeps the moisture in, protects the plants. And then the next step is so important, water, 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 okay? We can put five to, one to five gallons in clay soil, five to 30 gallons in well draining soil, and that's per one gallon plant on that day, which means that you probably have to cycle through several times to get that much water, but it's the only way to really remove air pockets and settle the soil. Well, at this point, we might put down a granular pre-emergent, which kills seed in the soil, not the plants. And we'll also, yeah, put down the mulch and then water, water, water on top of the mulch to consolidate it and hydrate the site. Touching on maintenance, pest control. It might surprise you to know that one of our worst pests is something called Argentine ants. Argentine ants are the little buggers that get into your kitchens and bathrooms, very common, but they're a sugar ant and they have a close symbiotic relationship with sucking insects like aphids and scale. And it turns out this activity may be the single largest cause of death in native suburban landscapes. People have often wondered why their native plants are dying in their backyard and thriving on the hillside right behind the house. Well, this is one of the primary reasons. When you look at this root right here, it's all bumpy. That's not bark, that's scale. And the scale was sucking all the water and sugar out of this plant, but it's done below ground where you don't see what's going on. And it was so dehydrated, it actually started to crack. You can see the cracking in here. They also take soil off the roots. The plants often become destabilized and they get sort of wobbly in the soil. They plant weeds like crazy and they spread diseases, okay? We use slow acting beds to knock out the 
colonies. And then we use a combination of a spray of pyrethroid, neem oil, and Super Thrive as a root soak so that can save a collapsing plant. And I've actually been able to save dying wild lilacs and manzanitas that were unsalvageable before. And they come back like they're sprouting back from the fire. So here's some case histories, guys. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how would you like to be this guy? Okay, a little late, wouldn't you say? Look at his roof. What is that roof? Well, I think he did survive, fortunately. I don't know how his house did, but this is in Poway, Branch of Bernardo. And we've had more fire-involved native landscapes than any other contractor we know of out of there. And here are a few examples. Uh, these are the landscapes that we've had in various fires. We had one in the Pumashaw, which was up on... Uh, Palomar Mountain. We had two in the Pines Fire that was in Julian. These all survived. We had seven in the Cedar Fire. Uh, one in Santa Isabel, three in Ramona, three in Poway. We had six in the Witch Creek Fire, three in Ramona, three in Rancho Bernardo. I had two in the Harris Fire, not Harrison, Harris Fire, which is down, actually it just burned again out there in Lawson Valley. Uh, we had one in Hidden Meadows that survived the fire when some kids were playing with fireworks at the bottom of the slope. It burned right up to my client's backyard and stopped. <laughs> and a fire marshal for the Sea of Encinitas who ran <laughs> actual burn tests on the gorilla hair. Jordan, I don't remember the gentleman's name. He was wonderful. He was the old fire marshal there during the Lux project. And he, he stopped the project when he saw this redwood mulch. And I told him to go run some burn tests. And he came back and he said, what kind of fire retardant are you putting in this stuff? <laughs> and I said, no, actually, it's, it's naturally fire retardant redwood. But it's got to be consolidated. And that's so important. You can burn steel wool if you want to, if it's oxygenated. So here's a customer's yard after the cedar fire, OK? Not all the mulch burned. The plants, some of the plants were scorched, they're all alive, they all came back. Large areas were not burned. And look at the, these flags up here. Just shake your head, Jess, can you see these, my pointer? Can you see my pointer? Okay, good. Yeah, and we also, good. we're just about out of time too. So we're, we're finishing up here. These are the last case histories. And uh, here's the mulch in the backyard. Again, all the plastic flags. That didn't mean that this house almost didn't fire, burn down because a week before the cedar fire, there was a cord of firewood right here against the house. And thank God the wife won the, uh, the debate and he moved the cord of firewood away from the house next to the propane tank. And uh, uh, the house was saved and the, fire, the propane tank didn't burn, it just gassed off, which is what they're designed to do and big sections of the redwood did not burn, and lots of hardscape. And actually, a wicker chair at the back almost burned down the house, but fortunately, Cal Fire put it out. Plus, they had double-pane windows, plus they had boxed-in eaves, and that was the look out the back door to show you that they're in the Cedar Fire. Here's the Rangeland Fire. This was a uh, witch. This was what grape does in a fire. You'll notice the burned Benjamina here, ficus. Uh, Shows you the relative fire resistance between non-native rosemary and a native buckwheat that still had green leaves covering it. Again, planting too close here, I admit it, but the hydration kept them from burning up into the eaves. Showed you this picture before. Okay, Witch Creek fire again, hydrated, didn't burn this, this wooden uh, deck, which we did not put in, but it was lightly hydrated and it came back, this is three years later, same landscape. Uh, again, the point here, a lot of these houses cleared over 100 feet. This guy cleared 300 feet around and no house. And what that tells you is that we're finding that if you clear everything down to mineral soil around the house, that might be one of the worst things because you create the perfect bowling alley for embers. Nothing to perturb that airflow and cause turbulence. And the only thing to slow down that, those embers is your house, okay? Here, our hydrated landscape 
the Harris fire went all the way around the edge, didn't even burn the mulch, went on all the way up to the top of Lawson Mountain. There's two houses here, both of them called them, both of them said, Reuben, your landscape saved my house. And it doesn't get any starker than this, irrigated native landscape chaparral. And finally, in erosion control, if you have a situation like this, just put in, don't, don't seed, God, please don't seed after fire. Don't bring in rye grass, please. Okay, in this case, you put in T posts, you weed the dead branches, you create these debris dams that hold back the debris. Do it about every 20 feet in these gullies. The water can get through, you can put sandbags around the back of the house. Water comes through, the debris held back, and then all the wildflowers start to come. This is what happens when you seed after a fire. This is what it should look like. Okay, this is Del Dios after Witch Creek fire. This is Del Dios. Everybody was running to the desert and here's Escondido. Look at that. And here's that landscape in the rebound. Fortunately, this is a site that was seeded. This is how it should have looked. One year later, five years later, and that's the end. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Greg. That was great. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, before, let's see here. Okay, so I'll go ahead and ask the questions that we have in here. And then at the end, I also have a slide to put up that will show everyone's contact information. So if we don't have a chance to address your question today, um, you can feel free to reach out to any of us and we're happy to help. So the first question I have here is from Shelly and she said, when thinning, should I choose some plants over others? Um, so, yes, we tend to uh, probably favor the evergreen native plants like the manzanitas, mission manzanitas, wild lilac, coffee berry, things like that. Um, and then we're probably, I don't rip them out. We cut like the sagebrush in that to the ground, okay? Uh, because we don't want more weeds coming in and we, we don't want to lose the erosion control, okay? But we cut them to the ground. And then we take all the debris that we cut out of there, chip it up, and I usually put it back, especially on the pathways, to kind of minimize the return of the dry, weedy, you know, non-native fire-prone weeds, okay? And yes, it's a mulch, yes, it can burn, but in reality, if you prune things up and thin them out, you're still maintaining that separation distance between the mulch and the bottom of the canopy. Okay, and then, all right, it looks like I can't share my screen and view the chat at the same time, so <laughs> sorry about okay. that. Um, okay, so the next question is from John and says, when planting on a slope, what native plants are good for fire safety and also slope retention? Yeah, so that's a question I get and, and it's really interesting because fire safety with native plants is really not so much about what plants you choose, but rather if they're lightly hydrated or not. And some of the ones we think of as being fire bombs actually benefit the greatest including buckwheats that have green leaves after the fire comes through because they were lightly hydrated. It takes a little water to hydrate. Having said that, evergreen plants definitely have a little bit of an advantage. And so I will give you a list of like five plants. Dwarf coyote brush, okay, pigeon point coyote brush, which is Bacris. Uh, Ground cover Ceanothus, the wild lilac. Any of the ground covers is fine. Yankee Point and Joyce Coulter's probably do the best down here. Ground cover Manzanitas are wonderful. There's a bunch of them. Uh, uh, the Franciscan Manzanita has a really neat backstory. I don't have time to get into, but it's really tough and easy. Uh, it's only about a foot high and four to six feet across. Also, John Dorley Manzanita is very colorful and low growing. Carmel Sur, there's all kinds of ground cover Manzanitas. Um, there is actually a really nice ground cover sage, believe it or not, because it stays so low and it hydrates well. 
and it's called jade carpet. Very easy to grow. So, and I think I think that right there is probably enough to do a really nice slope ground cover landscape. And um, John also asked, it looks like it's the last question we have on the chat here. John asked, where is a good place to buy native plants here in San Diego? So we have a local wholesale supplier called Musa Creek. They're up in Valley Center, but they're wholesale only. However, they sell to a majority of our local retail nurseries. Okay, so for Olivenhain, one of your closest is Green Thumb Nursery, which is in San Marcos, okay? They carry a lot of Musa Creek's native plants. And what's really cool is you can get on the Musa Creek Nursery website, look at what they have in stock, your inventory, put in your order, pay for it online, and they will deliver it to that nursery for you to pick up. So you can order it, off their inventory, pay for it. And all you have to do is show up and pick it up at the nursery. It's a really great way to go. There's also uh, Natives West. I don't know if they do retail down in Chula Vista. And there's, of course, good old Tree of Life Nursery, which is up in San Juan Capistrano. Okay, so, but I love how Moosey Creek, they're growing good plants and they're locally available through retail outlets and you can order online. Thank you. Looks like we do have one last question that came in um, from Shelly, who would like to know where she can find your books. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the plug. I appreciate that. <laughs> so uh, I'm fortunate that our books are available just about from any bookseller. Um, you can get them through Barn their Barnes & Noble. Uh, I like to try to emphasize supporting local uh, booksellers and vendors because they're having a hard time, but also they're available on Amazon. Okay, and you're gonna be—it's gonna be cheaper on Amazon. Um, but I've done a lot of my book signings, and that are in support of booksellers and organizations and places that sell my books, just to try to to help them out. And uh, but yes, you can get them on. Really, any, any, anybody that sells books, uh, typically you can find them. All right, great. Well, um, on that note, I think that wraps up our, our Firewise webinar today. I'm going to go ahead and put that slide back on the screen again with everyone's contact information in case anybody has any questions that they'd like to follow up. Um, thank you, Jordan and Encina Spire, so much for presenting today. And thank you, Greg, as well. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us. Um, again, I'm putting that information on the screen. Feel free to reach out to any of us if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, have a great afternoon. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Greg. My great pleasure. pictures. Great pictures, Greg. Yeah, thank you too. I loved your, I really loved your, uh, your uh, uh, presentation. It's, I mean, you guys are right on the edge of it right now. You guys are uh, right out in front. Good. I'm glad to hear.